Sick of not hearing what you're playing at a show. All the monitor wedges are just messy and feeding back. You can't hear yourself. Say goodbye to all of that today because I'm going to show you how to mix and save your own in-ear mixes for your band. Hey, I'm Chris. I'm a front of house engineer and tour manager. I work with a number of different bands. In the previous video, I showed you all the hardware you need to get your own in-ear monitor rig set up. If you want to watch that, the link's just here. Uh, it's also in the description below if you want to check that out before continuing to watch this video. Before we dive into the mixing of the ears, I just want to touch on the splitters for a second. Now you need these to split the signal into your in-ears rack in the first place. Uh, again, I talked about it in my previous video. Uh, what I didn't talk about is the specifics of how this works and how exactly to set it up. I just kept it simple. So basically how it works is your mic comes into the front panel here. This is labeled kick in. So this would be the microphone from the inside of the kick drum. On the back, for every one input on the front is two outputs. See how this twice as much? So the way that works is you have one link out, which is basically just the direct pass through through the splitter. Then you have a transformer isolated out. So what that means is the signal that comes out of the transformer isolated out is a duplicate of the signal, but it's not directly connected to the incoming signal because of witchcraft and wizardry to do with transformers. This means it influences which output you use for what purpose. Some mics you use need phantom power, like this Beta 91, for example. This is a kick in mic. Uh, it needs phantom power to work, which is 48 volts sent down the XLR cable to the mic. Now, usually what provides that power is the mixing desk. In the case of the splitter, you end up actually having two mixing desks connected to this mic, but one of them is through the transformer isolated out, which means you cannot pass the phantom power through that connection. Depending on how you work, this affects which output you use to go to your in-ears mixer. If you wanna practice in a rehearsal space just using your in-ears rig, and you have mics like this that need phantom power, then you need to connect your in-ears mixing desk to the direct link out so that your mixing desk can provide the phantom power needed for the microphone to work. This also means that then when you go to a venue, your desk needs to be powered on for the mic to get power. The, the front of house console cannot pass power through the transformer isolated out. If you're leaving lines patched in throughout the show, even for other bands to play, this means that you need to leave your mixer powered on throughout the whole show to get phantom power to those mics. It's just something to think about while you're setting this up and it'll help you decide which way around to put your outputs. If you're at all confused about what outputs I'm talking about and the inners mixing desk and stuff, again, watch my previous video linked in the description. That explains all the hardware needed to set this up. So the other buttons we have on the splitter include the ground lift. Uh, when you connect different devices together, sometimes it forms a ground hum through like the shielding of the cables. This basically interrupts that ground loop to stop the hum. If you're hearing a hum on a channel, try the button, see if it works. Uh, the other buttons we have are these link buttons, which I've actually pulled out. They, they're normally like these white little square buttons. And what they do is they link one input to four outputs on the back. You'd only use this for like needing an extra an extra output for like a broadcast mix or a separate recording mix, etc. Uh, in your case, just using it for an in-ears rig, you never need them. And when they're accidentally pushed, it causes an issue. You start getting the kick in mic through the kick out, you start getting the snare mic through the hi-hats and it's just like, what is going on? So my advice is, unless you are using this for another purpose, as well as an in-ears rig, get rid of those buttons, either glue them up which I've seen people do and I've done before, or just pull the buttons right out like I have done here. So this is the mixer that my band uses. It's the Behringer X-Air XR16. Uh, it's 16 channels in, uh, four mono outs and a stereo out. Uh, in my last video, I explained the different ways you could set this up and how this fits into the in-ears rig. There's loads of different mixers you can get, all different price ranges, all different numbers of inputs and outputs. This is one of the cheapest that you can find. Uh, they also do a even smaller one with just 12 inputs and a slightly bigger one with 18 inputs as well, which has a couple more outputs. It all depends on how many channels your band needs or wants in their ears and how many members you have needing mixes coming out of it, basically. So on the front panel, we have all the inputs here. We've got eight combi ports, which can take XLRs or jacks, and we have eight jack inputs. If you're using mics that need phantom power, they need to be connected to the first eight because phantom power can only be provided by these combi ports. The outputs are here down the bottom, and you've also got a headphone out. So top left of the front panel, we have the ethernet port, which is what you use to connect your external router because this built-in router is terrible. Uh, 
Then next to that, you have the switch, which decides what you're using to connect. So if it's in the left position, you're using the ethernet socket. If it's in the central position, it says Wi-Fi client. This is for if you're installing this in a permanent position and the venue or location you have this has their own Wi-Fi network. You basically then connect this to the Wi-Fi network and connect your devices to the same Wi-Fi network. So that's what that's for. And then the last one on the right is the access point, which is its own built-in router, which is terrible. So this USB socket can be used for firmware updates. It can be used to store scenes, which I'll talk about later. It can also be used to record a stereo mix down of the show and you can then play it back through there as well. Uh, another option for this is you put a load of songs on a USB stick and you can actually use this mixer to play back in tracks. Say you're a karaoke singer, this can be an all-in-one solution. Uh, here we have MIDI in and out. Uh, you can use MIDI foot switches and MIDI controllers to do stuff like mute channels, change scenes, push play on the tracks on the USB, that kind of thing. So let's plug it all in and show you how to use the software. Uh, in this video, I'm going to show you the absolute basics of getting the audio through the mixer and leveling a mix for you and your bandmates. Um, I'll touch on more complex things in the next video, like signal processing and adding effects. But for now, let's just keep this simple. Let's get the sound in, through and back out to your ears and allow you and your bandmates to mix your own in-ear mixes. So here we have the interface. When you first connect, what you need to do is connect your laptop or whatever device you're on to the Wi-Fi that's being broadcast by the XAIR mixer. When you first turn it on, it'll be broadcasting a network that has no password. So you just connect to that. Uh, you open up this XAIR edit software, which I'll have the download link in the description below. And once you have it open, you come up here to set up. I'm already connected, but what you'll see here is the name of the mixer. I've renamed it to LBL Mix. You can rename it using this button here. If you click it and hit connect, then that'll connect you to the mixer. You can see I'm already connected. Here in the WLAN page is where you choose the network name for your mixer and a password. I recommend doing that just so that there's not an open network that anyone can connect to. Definitely set a password. But like I said before, the Wi-Fi router built into the XAIR is not the best. I said that in my previous video, I recommend getting another router connected through the ethernet port. Then obviously you connect to that router instead of connecting to this. But this software will still see it through the other router. So once you're connected, um, there's two options here to choose. Uh, there's mixer to PC and PC to mixer. Uh, the first time you connect, doesn't matter. Every other time after that, always choose mixer to PC because the mixer is going to be the most up-to-date mix that you have. If you're connecting with phones and stuff, as they're editing the mix, the mixer has the most up-to-date version. So always choose mixer to PC. The same happens on the Android app as you're connecting with that. It lets you choose mixer to PC or PC to mixer. So choose mixer to PC. Uh, and then once you're connected, you'll see your mixer like this. What I've done is I've gone through and labeled six channels here. I'll show you how to label it. You just right click uh, on the channel name here and it brings up a box where you can type and choose a color. So today I'm using some multi-track stems of my band. So we've got groups coming through the channels. In an actual scenario, you'd have single mics. So for example, the first channel would be kick, snare, uh, rack tom, floor tom, hats, bass guitar, guitar stage left, guitar stage right, and then vocals, you know, so that's how it would actually look. Uh, and today's a bit weird because I'm just using pre-recorded stuff just to illustrate my points. On the right hand side here, you'll see all the different outputs we have. So we've got the main out, which corresponds to the main outputs on the front of the mixer. Then we have these buses you can see here, I've labeled the first one, Chris. I'll show you how to label them. You first click on it, and up here is where you label it. So you right click just like on every other channel, and I'm gonna call this one. Sean and make him pink. So now you can see how this is starting to work already. When I click on Chris, the whole mixer turns blue. It's like telling you, this is Chris's mix that you're doing at the moment. Uh, when I click on Sean, it turns pink. This is Sean's mix you're doing, right? So you get the idea. So you can see there's audio playing here. What I would do, say this is a kick mic. Uh, you're in rehearsals. You get the drummer just to keep hitting the kick mic, just like you would do in a normal sound check. And then at the top here, you have some gain. So you adjust this gain until the signal is about two thirds, three quarters of the way up, up the bar here. See the top of the bar ends at zero. You don't want it to be slamming into the top. That's called peaking. It'll ruin the entire sound of what you're listening to and it'll just make the in-ear mix terrible. So just try and make it so that it's relatively loud, but not peaking. So you can see, because we're listening to the Chris mix, if I turn this up on the main page, we hear nothing. So if I was the drummer, plugged into the main mix, this I would now hear the drums. But what we're gonna do is head over here to where it says Chris, click on Chris. We've set our gain, in this case it's zero, but yours, might, I'll just uh, illustrate, you can click and drag. See how now it's peaking at the top there? So you don't want that. 
by default, bus one comes out of output one, bus two comes out of output two, bus three comes out of output three, and bus four comes out of output four. To check these outputs, you head over to this page here and you click on the aux outs. And here you can see on the left-hand side, aux one, which is the output on the front of the mixer, is bus one, post fader, which is what you want. And the same aux two is bus two. Uh, you can change the inputs around as well. You can see channel one on the left corresponds to the analog input one. It's quite an easy system to understand. You just go across and up and that's what you have. If, for example, you've patched it in the wrong way and you don't want to get into your rig and move the cables around, here you can just swap it around. So yeah, as you bring in these levels up, check the meters on the front of your in-ear transmitter systems. For example, on the PSM 200s that we have, uh, it has a single LED that goes green, then orange, then red when it's too hot, when the signal's too hot. So you'd start by bringing up the thing you want the loudest in your mix. If you're a singer, it'll be the vocals. If you're a drummer, it'll probably be the click because you want to play in time with the click, if you're playing to click. If you're a guitarist, it might still be the click. You know, just think about what you need to have most of in your mix uh, in order to play the show well. We're going to pretend to be a drummer. I'm going to bring up the click first. Bring it up to a comfortable level, which is just before where your in-ears transmitter peaks. Maybe a bit lower, just give it some headroom. And then you build your mix around the loudest element. So, and, and the tip with this is, let me just stop that for a second. The tip with this is be as minimal as you want. I mean, I know guitarists who literally play with a click and their guitar because that's all they need to play live. For me personally, it takes me a bit out of the zone and I like to have a bit more in my mix because I like to hear the whole song come together. But if it does make you play better just to hear a click and guitar, that's that's your preference. Um, but as a general rule, less is more with in-ear mixing because it makes it clearer, obviously. The less elements you have, the more room you have to hear what you want to hear. So if you're having trouble hearing things and your in-ears are a bit of a mess, Try taking things out that you don't need. Um, but we're going to start now, pretending we're a drummer. Bring up the click to a level that the in-ear transmitter is comfortable with. Uh, maybe the light's just turning a bit orange there. Uh, and then we're just going to build the mix around. So bring in the drums. Now, because I'm using pre-recorded stems, everything's going to line up beautifully. But your mix might not always look as in line as this. Bit of guitars. Bit of synth, bit of vocals, and there's not much on this subtrack, but let's bring it up anyway. So there, I'd say, ah, oh, I, I might want a bit more drums in my mix. So what I'm going to do is bring the guitars down to give it a bit more space. So once you've built your mix, if everything's sounding a if everything's sounding nice, but it's a bit too loud for your in-ears transmitter, you've got a master level right here on the right-hand side for, for your whole mix. See where it says Chris? Underneath here is the whole mix. So I'll just mute this mix, uh, and then we'll flip over to Sean's mix. So now Sean's got his in-ears in. Uh, his in-ears are connected to output 2, which is, corresponds to bus 2, which we can check here in the in and out matrix. Aux 2, bus 2. Yep, we're good to go. So Sean's a singer. So, Sean wants vocals above everything else. What's a bit of click? Bit of drums? So now you can see, if I mute Sean's mix and go back to Chris, you can see Chris is the drummer, click and drums. I mean, not the drummer, but I'm just pretending to be the drummer. And then Sean's mix is a lot more vocal. So in that way, you keep going through, you build each, each mix individually. For example, Rob might absolutely be in love with synth. There you go, Rob has tons of synth. Uh, and that's the basics of how you build an in-ears mix for each member. If things start peaking, head back up here to the gain and drag it down. Now what you can notice here is the top four bars here represent the amount sent to each output. So you can see for the drums, 
you can see Chris has got more than Sean. Again, the colors correspond to the colors. So Chris is blue, Sean's pink. You can see Chris is blue, Sean's pink. Rob is yellow. Um, and so at a glance, you can see this also helps in a live scenario, instead of clicking two things, you can just go, oh God, I've got too much of this, and you can drag it there. What I will say as well, if you mute something, it mutes it for everybody. That's a global mute. So if you don't want something, turn it down, don't mute it, because it'll just mute it for everybody. Uh, and the gain, likewise, also affects everybody. So if you turn the gain up thinking that the drums aren't loud enough, it's gonna turn it up for everybody. Instead, adjust your fader in your mix. If you are using the main mix as an output, you just click main, this, this is then the mix that heads out of the main output. It doesn't have a color like the auxes do. So if you've decided to connect your in-ears mixer through the link outs to provide phantom power for your mics so that you can rehearse with your rig, um, to turn on phantom power for each channel, it's up here. Uh, you can see where it says 48, that's for 48 volts. So you just right click, there you go, 48 volts is on for channel eight. Phantom power can only be provided through the combi ports on the Xair, there's eight of them. When you're working out your patching, make sure you put any mics that need phantom power in those first eight channels. Otherwise you won't be able to give them phantom power through the jack ports. Once you've built your mix and you're happy, the mixer does automatically save it. If you power it off and power it on again, it will just start from where you left off. But a good practice um, is to start recording snapshots. So if you head over here to where it says snapshots, a little picture of a camera, you click on snapshot, Here's all the snapshots we have saved on this mixer. Now you head down to a slot that you don't mind going over uh, and you click on it. You choose a name up here, like IEM tutorial, and then you just hit save. Okay, and there you go, it's saved. So then if you're playing a massive room, sounds a bit reverby and you have to adjust your met levels, you can hit save on that big room. Say the next day you play a small room and change everything, but the day after you go back to a big room, you can then head back into snapshots click on it and hit load. And then there you go, the snapshot's loaded. You can also export these files as scenes as kind of a double backup. Um, and these scenes save locally to the device you're saving on. The snapshots save within the mixer. Uh, and the scenes, for example, if I hit save a scene here, it brings me up a dialog box where I create a file on this computer. Uh, so that's like a double backup, which you can do every, every now and then, or every day if you feel the need to. So that's how you mix each person's individual mix. I hope that really helps you just get things set up in the first place. In the next video, I'll be talking about processing the signal, adding EQ and compression to give the mix a better overall sound, a bit more space for you in your ears, uh, as well as adding some effects like reverb and delay. I'll also do a video on the mobile app that you can use to mix your ears while on the stage. Um, it is an option, obviously, to have the laptop side stage so you can all each go over to the laptop and mix it on this software, which is a perfectly good option. You know, um, we have a tech who stands side stage, who mixes our ears. We can just point him and go, guitar up, and he'll just turn it up. Because sometimes when you're playing, it's hard to go over to your phone on top of an amp and start fiddling with it. Plus you look like you're sending a text in the middle of the show, which is a bit weird. Yeah, so having a laptop is a perfectly viable option, but uh, again, it's just more convenient during the sound checks to have your own apps because you can do it instantly. So I'll show you that in the next video. If you want to subscribe, hit the notification bell so that you know when I put that video up, that'll be great. This is my second ever YouTube video. I hope it's as helpful as the first one. Again, if you haven't watched the first one, check it out, description below. That'll give you the whole picture to set this up for yourself. Everything from beginning to end, these two videos are kind of like a package. So thanks for watching. See you next time.